Hey, it's Matt from Cast Labs, and today we're going to be looking into pedal kickback. So I've read a bunch of pink bike articles. I remember Gwyn's famous chainless run at Leo Gang in 2015, and I've talked about it with a bunch of my friends, but I still don't know if it actually happens when I'm riding. So I decided to take a kind of different approach, and I'm actually going to see if I can directly measure pedal kickback on the bike and correlate that with kind of my subjective feedback as a rider. But before we do any of that, we should probably understand what pedal kickback is. I'm going to try to not go too into the weeds about the derivation, but you can think of pedal kickback kickback as the induced rotation of your cranks as you go through your suspension travel. On Bike Checker's website, there's a pretty complete derivation, which you see here. And I actually just take these equations and translate them into Python for doing my actual calculation for the field test. There are three components to pedal kickback. One is the increase in length of your upper chain line. Two is your horizontal chainstay growth, and three is chain wrap. You get a, a pedal kickback angle that's induced from each of these components. You sum them up, and then that's your pedal kickback. When we're in the field, we're actually interested in pedal kickback angular velocity and whether or not that's higher than our rear wheel angular velocity because you only feel pedal kickback if your angular velocity induced by pedal kickback is higher than that of your rear wheel. Otherwise, it just gets taken up by your free hub body. So now that we kind of know what pedal kickback is, we know that in the field, we have to be able to compute the equation for the upper chain line and the position of the rear axle with respect to the BB. Okay, so how the hell do we actually compute any of this stuff? Well, there's the data acquisition side of things in terms of what I've actually instrumented the bike with, but there's also some software that I've written that'll help with this computation that I can show you guys now. Long story short, uh, I basically use a photo of a S5 Stumpy Evo to compute all the important kinematic points uh, and the important geo points. It's not perfect, but I used a uh, measuring tape and calipers on my Stumpy to make sure that it's relatively accurate. From here, I just throw that in the database. Um, and then in Python, I've created what's called a bike class. And so if you're not familiar with programming, this is basically kind of a programmatic representation of a bike. So it has all the attributes um, that I need for a bike. And in this class, I've created functions to do things like compute pedal kickback, which also needs a function for computing the upper chain line, um, solving the kinematics, which allows us to get the position of all the kinematic points, including that important rear axle position. And so I'll plot some metrics here, you can see the pedal kickback values through the stroke of the Stumpy Evo, which in terms of other things on the market are kind of high. Um, and then also you can see the, the kinematics be animated. And the kinematics were kind of hard to compute. It's like this huge 20 equation system of equations or something. Um, but it's just like dynamic stuff. So that's everything we need on the software side. Now let's go into the actual setup and finally get out to field test. All right, so here I've got my Stump Jumper Evo all wired up. Let's take a look at some of the instrumentation. So I've got a little data acquisition unit that I designed. All these parts are printed on the Creality Ender 3 3D printer. It's super cheap and it does the trick. I've got a reed switch in the back and I'm using six magnets and this is gonna give me really accurate wheel speed data. I've printed some mounts for a potentiometer which just measures rear uh, shock travel and then I can use the data in my database to calculate what the rear travel is at the wheel. Also really important is this feedback button. Um, I can hit this when I think that I feel pedal kickback. We can use this to correlate my subjective feel with uh, what's actually happening in terms of pedal kickback in the data. All right, I'm at an undisclosed Santa Cruz trail and we're doing run number one. We're in ninth gear. Gonna see if we feel any pedal kickback down this. a little feedback there but nothing crazy a little trail gap here we're gonna hit another undisclosed trail good old magnets dialed in you go outside you can hit a little shot here into the corner nice go ahead Go, 
time of year. Fucking for science. I just had an idea. If anything's gonna have some pedal kickback, it'd be a slow speed big drop like this. The jungle drop. Alright, gonna hit that again. But now we're in our highest gear, which should be theoretically the most induced pedal kickback. Because that felt pretty smooth, honestly. Didn't notice anything, but maybe it's just because I was puckered for the drop. Let's go dropping in. Oh, that was funny. Nothing, I don't think, in terms of shit that I felt. Be surprised if we got pedal kickback in here just from how fast the wheel speed is. We'll see. Pay attention. I'm also trying to ride. Go four foot drop. So if there's pedal kickback anywhere, I better be here. Let's take a look. Take it off this. Oh. Yeah. All right. Field test is a wrap. Got uh, five laps in and a couple of the jungle drops for a nice kind of slow speed drop. And now we'll. Uh, head back to the computer and do some analysis and see what we find. So I've created another database that stores metadata and logger data from field tests. So it's as easy as plugging in my data logger and running these two functions. And I have everything synced to my database and I can easily query by trail or by field test or by rider location and do analysis essentially at the click of a button. This method prevents data from getting obsoleted since everything's automated and standardized. And so this allows me, for example, in a year from now when I have say 200 runs for the pedal kickback research to do analysis at the click of a button on pretty huge data sets. And so we're gonna query our database by field test. I've called our test PK test three, and then I'll create a field test object. So I've made a field test class, which you can think of as similar to our byte class, but just for a field test. So it has all these functions that allow us to do analysis on all of our data at the click of a button. So for today, we're gonna to run PK analysis, which is pedal kickback analysis. And this list here, 9, 10, 10, 9, 12, 10, is the gearing that we were in for each run. Because if you remember, pedal kickback depends on gearing. And so how this function works is basically, since we have our rear potentiometer, we know where we are in our travel at every given point during a run. And using that equation that we saw earlier for pedal kickback, we can get our pedal kickback angle. We take the time derivative of that to get the angular velocity of our cranks. And we compare that with our angular velocity of our rear wheel because we have those six magnets on the back. And so if the induced angular velocity from pedal kickback at some given time step is larger than that of our rear wheel, then we know we have what we call a pedal kickback event. Um, and so let's take a look at what our results say. Here are our results. Um, that the function gave back. Um, so let me first explain what we're looking at. Uh, you can ignore this graph on the left for now. Um, this is just a graph for visualization of a single run. Uh, we'll talk about that in a bit, but let's look on the right for now. Um, so on the right are our numerical results from all seven runs. And this is really crazy because we went from, you know, bantering with our friends about uh, pedal kickback or, or arguing on pink bike as to whether it happens or not to seeing that, wow, at least on Matt's bike, when Matt's riding it, he does uh, experience pedal kickback. So we had seven runs, five of which were full trails, two of which were just the jungle drop. And in that we had 46 events. So that's a little over six events per run. So that's six instances of pedal kickback per run. We had 10 events of what I call perceptible pedal kickback. So perceptible pedal kickback is when pedal kickback occurs, uh, computationally speaking, but then also I hit my feedback button, which indicates that, hey, Matt felt pedal kickback. 
but there's a few conditions um, that I use to filter this. Pedal kickback needs to occur. The bike speed needs to be over one mile per hour. And the button press has to happen within five seconds of the event. So we also have imperceptible pedal kickback events. There were 36 of those or about five per run. And these are just when computationally speaking, pedal kickback occurred, but I didn't hit my button to indicate that I felt anything. And I also included a metric called false positives. So this is the amount of times that I hit the button, but it wasn't actually a pedal kickback event. So an interesting thing to note here is that I have more false positives per run than I do perceptible pedal kickback events. The numerical results are for all seven runs, but I've included a plot of just a single run for visualization purposes. The top plot is uh, the angular speed of your cranks is shown in the orange. So that's the theoretical angular velocity induced at your cranks by pedal kickback. The blue is the rear wheel angular speed in radians per second. We have two different colors of dots. Red is perceptible pedal kickback and blue is imperceptible pedal kickback. And this bottom chart uh, is basically I've converted wheel speed into vehicle speed, assuming the rear wheel isn't skidding. This is kind of hacky, but it's more just for visualization because I wanted to include a green X for button presses. This gives you a good idea of um, kind of how my algorithm works. So basically you'll see there's an instance of pedal kickback and Matt hit the, the button within five seconds. So this is an instance of perceptible pedal kickback. So this is interesting, it happens, it's non-negligible in terms of my ability to perceive pedal kickback. Another interesting thing I wanna look at is the jungle drop. I didn't feel pedal kickback, probably because it's just such a heavy drop that there's a lot of input to my arms, my hands, my feet, you know, and it's hard to discern where it comes from. But it did happen, it actually happened on both runs. We're looking at one here, and you'll see, it's kinda of cool, you see the angular velocity of my cranks theoretically drops to zero which means i'm in the air right there's no input at the rear wheel so i'm not getting any pedal kickback obviously and then when i land i get this instance of pedal kickback um, so that's kind of interesting i didn't feel pedal kickback on either jungle drop but it occurred on both all right so there you have it pedal kickback happens at least for me and on my stumpy evo i don't want to extrapolate and say that it happens everywhere for everyone or on every bike before we wrap up with my final thoughts i want to go over a few limitations and errors um, that could crop up from this study. So one assumption I make is that there's instant hub engagement. This actually isn't the case, right? Because there might be a couple degrees that it takes for your hub pawl to actually engage, especially on the DT Swiss hubs that I'm running. I didn't account for the magnitude of the pedal kickback event. So I could probably do some more filtering to say, hey, if the angular velocity induced by pedal kickback at the cranks is above the angular velocity of the wheel, by some percentage, then it's actually a um, significant, we might call it, pedal kickback event. So here's the conclusion. Um, pedal kickback happens, at least for me. So from what I've looked into, it's a valid design consideration for bike companies. That being said, I don't know where it should fall in terms of priorities. You know, is this more important than your anti-squat or anti-rise target or your wheel rate target? The other really interesting thing that I didn't think about until doing this study is I've actually done a few of these field tests, but on the analysis that we're doing on this field test, I forgot my half shell. So I was riding in my full face. But compared to my other field tests, I noticed less um, pedal kickback events. And I have a, a feeling that a lot of this is to do with the sound. So this kind of shows us sound is a really important part of the ride experience, even if it's not objectively changing how the bike rides. So that could be a good argument for bell drive or something. But yeah, that's my study. Let me know if you have questions um, in the comments below. Uh, things that you think I missed, things that you think I messed up, uh, and stuff that you maybe want to see in the future because I've got all this stuff I've built, all these engineering tools to do cool and fun research, and uh, I'm excited to do more. So yeah, Matt from Cast Labs signing off. Peace out, everybody.